Kathy and I are going to do a life group this time uh, for with senior adults. And you know, I used to, it really aggravated me when I was a lot younger and they'd hand me those senior menus at the different restaurants. Like, <laughs> I ain't old yet, you know. And then when I figured out they give you a break and give you a little bit of a discount, well, you know, I'll go ahead and take it. So it's all right. So you might consider yourself a senior or not, but you may hang out, like to hang out with the seniors. But anyway, we're going to be having life groups with seniors, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Join a life group. It's a place to be. It's going to be so good. Praise God. Oh, man. I'm excited about tonight and be able to share the word with you. Uh, we're going to go over to Acts, the 19th chapter. We're going to start there. Praise God. I just trust that the Holy Spirit will move tonight in your heart, and uh, you'll hear things that maybe I won't even say that'll make it good for you. Praise God, praise God. Well, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, okay? Father, we love you and we bless you. I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for your love toward us, each and every one of us here tonight. I pray that you be with those who couldn't be here tonight, Father, wherever they might be, to bless them and keep them and Lord, I pray for our families. I pray for our children and, and wherever they might be to keep them safe and safe from harm and be a, a blessing to them, Lord. And, but our time together tonight, Holy Spirit, I would ask that you would move tonight in everyone's heart to open up our understanding, quicken our minds to receive what you have for us tonight. Have us, help us to have a, a receptive heart. Teach us, teach us, Holy Spirit, how to even receive from the Lord. How to, how to love on God, but also how to receive from the Lord tonight what we need to hear. And, and so also, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bless me and to be able to share out of the, the passions of my heart and the abundance of what you've placed in my heart tonight and allow me to be a blessing and make sense of it all. <laughs> so Holy Spirit, have your way here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I, uh, I want the Holy Spirit to have his way. Uh, I really do. And I, I look for Holy Spirit as He moves when we come to services. And, you know, I, I've got so much going on inside of me right now as far as wanting to share the next two weeks uh, other than tonight that, you know, sometimes I, I could teach for hours and hours on what I'm going to start to share with you a little bit tonight. And sometimes it's hard to condense that and say, okay, Lord, what is it that you want to share tonight? What is it that you want to get across tonight? And, and I want to be sharing about the Holy Spirit. And I, we're going to start in Acts 19 chapter. But you know, I want to encourage you that as you look for God, I, I don't know why I, this was coming through my heart. You know, Holy Spirit, I, I come to a service thinking, Holy Spirit, you take off the way you want to. I always like when he's got it planned out ahead of time and I can, you know, have notes and all all of that, and I try to stay with my notes, and I like to stay with my notes. I'm a notes kind of guy, but sometimes it just takes off. And um, so, the, you know, the, the sound booth guys don't like that. No, they don't like that. <laughs> they're, they're real good at that, uh, try sometimes to follow the notes and things like that. But man, I want Holy Spirit to have His way in the next three weeks. Uh, to touch and change lives, to impact us any way that He wants to, and, and to see Him move in our midst. How many of you believe in a supernatural God? Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's a good, good, good. It ought to be every arm, hand in the place. And uh, I believe that God's still a God to be found, and He moves supernaturally, and He moves in our midst, and He's changing lives and touching and changing lives, and He does perform the miraculous, and, and I continually look for that. I look for lives changed through the Word of God. The Word of God impacts and changes lives, and and so tonight we're going to go to Acts 19 chapter, and I want to primarily talk about Holy Spirit. And Paul, Paul in the Acts 19 chapter, some very interesting things that, that I saw in this, these few verses. And I remember sharing this passage of Scripture with some preacher friends that I had. Kathy and I used to play guitars and sing out in a children's home way out in West Texas. And, and the chaplain there, we spent time with them. And, and I, I'm, he was from a denominational background. And I remember sharing with him, talking about the Holy Spirit and, and receiving that there was more than just salvation. And there's more to receive from, from God than just our ticket to heaven. And, and I began to tell him about this, this scripture as it referenced what we were talking about. He said, oh, that's not in there. That's not in there. And we read it and said, I have never seen that. You know, and so, you know, I'm, I'm always excited about things that God reveals to me that, man, I've read, how many times have I read this chapter? How many times have I read this book? And Lord, you're just bringing more and more. There are deeper and uh, more wonderful treasures in Christ yet to be had for you and I, no matter where you are in your walk. And I do understand that there's people, you know, we're at all different levels in our spiritual walk here tonight. Maybe if, if people that are coming and tuning in online, that, that we have these different levels, but God 
has got greater things for every one of us to, to grow in, to experience in Him. The riches and treasures of Jesus are far beyond what we could ever accomplish and, and, and absorb, right? But here's something that's very interesting in this. Let's look at ver, uh, verse 1, chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there'll be a Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? But didn't, I thought it was such an interesting question for him when he approached disciples, you know, disciples of the Christ, the Messiah, and said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we don't want you talking about. I have heard that response so many times over the years. I have pastored over 25 years. I've worked in the workplace for another 25 years. I know I don't look that old, but I've worked, you know, all these years and trying to share the gospel with people. They said, what are you talking about? I've never heard anything like that. And now notice the very next question that he asked them. He said, he said to them, unto what then were you baptized? Isn't that interesting? And to the what then were you baptized? And of course they responded and said, John's baptism. And then Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had a baptism because of baptism of repentance. Then they were baptized uh, in the name of Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with other tongues, spoke of tongues, and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. So technically here we're seeing three different baptisms. We're seeing a baptism of repentance, baptism of Christ, other translations into Christ, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thought that was so interesting. So I want to talk to you tonight about some life-changing encounters that I have had and so many other people have had in their lives. And, and I look for you to have a life-changing encounter if you haven't experienced the same thing that we're talking about in the next few weeks with the Holy Spirit. And it's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And maybe this, you know, some of you, this is going to catch you a little off guard. Maybe it's really new, you know, but I hope that you'll just come back and that I don't scare you off with some of this. Man, we need to learn and grow in the Word of God. Amen. So this baptism with the Holy Spirit... Now, let me tell you some of my story, because as I look back, I look back at my experiences, but I also realize that my experiences need to line up with the Word of God, but I can look back now and see what the Lord was doing. And at the age of 13, out in a West Texas town, out in the desert out there, there was a little, there was a little church down the street from where I lived, and I had never seen anybody going to church there before this, this night, this week. And one of my friends from school, they had just moved there, and he was inviting me to go, to, to church service. I guess they were having revival. That's what they were having. And it was one night, so I, I just wandered into that church. I thought, okay. After all those people got inside, it was so many people. <laughs> I bet there was 30 or 40 people in that room. <laughs> I mean, it was packed. I sat on the very back row. And at, at, I'd never been to anything like this. You know, I'd never seen anything like this. And I can't tell you what the preacher preached on that night. I can't tell you it all, and, but I know I look back now, he, 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 he gave an invitation. He got to the end of whatever he was talking about, and then he, he gave some kind of an invitation, and you know what he did? He walked right down the aisle to me sitting on the back row, and he said, are you ready to give your life up or give your life to Jesus? <laughs> no, yes, yes, yes. And I, it had to be God all over me because I wouldn't act like that normally. I, and, and I went down and knelt at their altar, and cried out to uh, Jesus. I didn't say the right words. I didn't know the right words to say. He didn't tell me the right words to say. I just said, Jesus, can you help me? And I walked out of there different. I walked out of there and I stood in the street on that dark street, no street lights in Grand Falls. They barely have any electricity there. And I, I stand out there in a the dark street, moonlight, and I felt like I had come home. I had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. Yet I didn't know what that was. I went home. I guess they told me when I walked out of there, you got saved tonight. No, oh, I got saved. I don't know what from. I don't know what to. I just got saved. <laughs> so I went home and I told my mom. I said, Mom, I got saved tonight. She said, that's good, son. <laughs> and uh, that's it. I don't remember ever asking me about it. 
I wanted to go to the church with all the other kids at school that they started the little Baptist church there in Grand Falls, Texas. And, and my mom wouldn't let me go. She said, no, you, you ain't going down to those Baptists are a bunch of hypocrites. And so I found out later she is raised Pentecostal early on. And Pentecostals and the Baptists didn't get along very good back then, you know. <laughs> so I didn't go to church. I visited a couple of times with my scoutmaster and his family, the Methodist church. And I was telling some friends the other day, I went, they asked me to go to church camp with them one year and one summer, and I went to church camp, and those kids were wilder than the ones I run with. I thought, oh my word. So I didn't have a background of church, and so I, I didn't even live right because I didn't know I was supposed to. I can remember at 17 years old thinking, I want to be good. I'd like to be good. I just don't know what that is. You know what I'm saying? And, and going into college, then the Lord started dealing with me at 17 years old, signing up for college. God started impacting my life. My parents started going back to church, and the church was pretty close to the United, uh, New Mexico State University where I was attending college. And, and I'd go with them occasionally, and that preacher, uh, it was really... Have you ever sat in church and felt like he's talking right to you? Somebody's telling him something? <laughs> Every time I go to church with him, he's talking right to me. He's talking right... I thought, y'all telling him stuff. What he's... <laughs> He's talking to me. I don't like that, you know? But it's just that I needed everything that he had. I mean, there's some experiences that night, and I'll tell you a couple of things of them, and I'm going to expand on them. I don't know how far I'm going to get. The good thing is we can come back next week. I can quit where I want to and just pick up next week. But I remember, I know what he did then. At the end of the service, he gave this invitation for people to come up for prayer. I never went up. But he, and, and then he was singing. They were singing. And he was walking the aisle, and he was singing something. God, he was saying in his microphone, God, break every fetter. And I thought he had a lisp. I thought, feather? You want to break a feather? I didn't know what a fetter was. Y'all know what those are? Yes. Chains. You know, break every chain, break every chain. And he's singing this. And I, okay, that was, it was okay. And, um, but he started talking in this funny language. And I thought, well, that, he must have learned that at preacher school. I don't know what that is, but it sounds cool. <laughs> I thought I'd heard French. I knew, I knew Spanish because I grew up with the Hispanics, but that wasn't either one of those, you know, or any of the German I saw on television. I thought, he must have learned that at preacher school. But then one night, my mom went down the, the aisle into the altar, and she received something supernatural and began to speak in other tongues. And I thought, whoa, okay, there's something real to this, because I know my mom don't make, he, she don't put on airs for nobody. The old farm girl that she, she don't put on airs, and this has got, there's something real to this. I don't know what it is, but there's something there. But I thought you had to be holier than thou to get it, okay? So that was kind of my background in college. God did so many things during college and just radically impacted my life. But, and then Kathy and I got married. I met Kathy. That was a God thing. I'm going to tell stories, baby. I'm trying not to tell too many stories. I'm, but it's... <laughs> God was shaking my world during college. I was, I was up into so much meanness, and some of that I won't tell you tonight, how God rescued me out of some things. But I remember one night coming in late. I'd been out carousing and carrying on and got in late. I, I parked my vehicle way back in the parking lot at the dorm, right at the top, because I was the last one in late at night. And I came in. It's dark. And I remember coming by this pickup truck, it's a Ford pickup truck, like a 74 or something like that. I can remember what it looked like. I came in from the back end of it. I was coming from the back, and there's a young boy sitting in the driver's seat, and he's just sitting there like he's contemplating. He's just sitting there like this. Something spoke to me and said, stop and talk to him. And I stopped in my tracks a few feet from the back of the truck, and I said, what? You know, stop and talk to him. Wait a minute. I don't know who that is. Stop and talk to him. But I don't know who that is. Somebody's talking to me. <laughs> I'm looking around. There's nobody but me. I don't know who that is, and I'm not going to stop and talk to him. And I walk right by the truck, squeezed through between the truck and the next vehicle. He's right in that truck. I went past him, went down to my dorm room, went to bed. I got up the next morning, coming out, going to go to classes, and they were dragging him out of that truck. He'd shot himself in the head that night. And it's still hard for me. It's still emotional. I was the last person between him and his eternity, and the Holy Spirit was trying to use me to do something there. 
You understand what I'm saying? So the Lord was starting to, ra- he was shaking my world up. I, after my second year of civil engineering department, I, I, uh, I st- I'm going to take a, a year off a break because something here is not right. And I met Kathy and she loved the Lord. She had a passion for the Lord. We ended up getting married, long story short, and got married. And, and uh, Kathy asked me a question. Ladies, it's okay to ask your husband, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? I just gave you permission, didn't I? Because <laughs> she asked me that. She, her heart was to know that I knew the Lord. I said, baby, I don't know. I don't know if I'd go to heaven or hell. I just don't know. I don't know what that means. And so she, her desire was to get me into a Bible study, which is like our life groups. And so I was working seven days a week, 24-hour call, and I had a night off and went 50 miles to a home group, March 23rd, 1976, around 7 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> And I, I was scary going to these home groups. I'd never been to something like that. That was a bit scary. Y'all know what that's like? Yeah. Come on now. I, I went into this home group, and the guys who sang in our wedding were there leading that group, and they played their guitars, and they sang, and, they, and he had a little message. And I thought, well, okay, I can handle this. Okay. It ain't too scary. I can handle this. And at the end of that service, uh, end of that time, he said, let's all break up into groups. There's about 40 people in there. Break into groups, about five people. Well, he put me in his group. That's a setup. That was a setup. <laughs> he put me in his group. It's he and I and some other guys in his group. And he said, if you could pray for someone tonight, who would it be? And I thought, oh, man. And I said, oh, my brother. I got an older brother that's 13 months older than me. And I said, my brother, I'd pray for him. We all named somebody. He said, okay, now let's hold hands. I said, oh, hold hands. <laughs> Men don't hold hands. Men don't hold hands, okay? We held hands. I'm sweating. It's, it's, you know? Then he said, now each of us go around and let's pray for that person you named. Oh, my word. I've, and, you know, let's see, we're holding hands and praying. But here's the thing. It impacted me so much. I thought, you mean I can pray out loud? You mean I can pray out loud? The only ones I heard pray out loud were the guys that were up on the front. Amen. Visiting a little Methodist church and going to those churches. The only guy that ever prayed was this guy up here. And from the night at 13 years old, standing out in that street in the dark of the night, from that night till that night, that night of March 23rd, 1976, every night in my mind, in my mind, I asked God, I named off all my loved ones, and said, God, would you take care of them and protect them? I didn't know I could pray out loud. So it impacted me. Well, it's all done, said and done. I made it through, got through the night. And after, this, after that time, they said, hey, why don't you and Kathy come over and visit with us a little bit before you go home? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Had the night off, we can go over. All they did was talk about God. That's all they did. They talked about God. I thought, man, these people really live this stuff. You, you don't talk about God after you leave church. <laughs> well, this is my experiences. Y'all, do y'all talk about God after you leave here? Hey, come on, man. You just like that couple, man. You're, you're a crazy lot. And he just, <laughs> and we, I, I thought we'd have a lot of conversation because he played quarterback in college and we had football background and we talked about football and I had an injured knee and it would swell up with water every once in a while and had a problem with that knee. He said, God wants to heal that knee. God wants to heal that knee. And do you believe it? He said, read a scripture. Well, oh, I guess so. You want to see it? What was I going to say? No. <laughs> What? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. He said, sit here in this chair. I sat in that chair. He picked up my feet. And he said, you know, history says that most people are created one leg a little shorter than the other. I said, really? I hadn't been to college, never heard that. But he said, I said, yeah. So my left leg was about five sixteenths shorter than my right one. I said, wow, okay. I guess you're right. He said, Lord, thank you for healing his leg and his back and his knee. And my left leg grew out. I felt it from my knee to my hip, this muscle. And this muscle for about two or three days had been like I'd had a good workout with weights. I did a lot of weightlifting back in the early days. My knee was healed supernaturally, never watered up again. I was on cloud nine. It's like, this stuff is real. This stuff is real. God is real. Oh my word. So he said, Kathy, she wanted to have a home group in our home in two weeks, starting in two weeks. He said, now, Stan, 
He said, now, if y'all going to have that home group in your, in your house, you're going to need the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, give him to me. <laughs> I, I didn't know any different. I hadn't been raised any, with any denominational barriers, some ill teaching or any... I, he said, he healed my knee. He said, I could have the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, give him to me. <laughs> Gave me some instruction and prayed for me. And, and, and taught me, talked to me about speaking in tongues, which I had no idea what that was, except for hearing that preacher that night and my mom. And I walked out of there was something different inside my heart. I had a fire and a boldness that was different on the inside. Have you ever felt like, Lord, I need something more? I need something on the inside burning on the inside. What happened to me that night brought a fire in my life. Kathy and I knelt down the next week in our living room at our coffee table, led my sister to the Lord. She accepted Christ. The next week, my brother-in-law, who was like a self-made man, and within six weeks, like 70 people got saved in our home group. It was like revival. It was, it was exciting. So my journey from that point on has been, Lord, what has happened to me? What has happened to me? And it's okay to ask questions. When we start talking about Holy Spirit, He has been my friend, like Jesus. He has been my friend, my constant companion. I desire, I have a passion to hear His voice because when I hear His voice, I hear the Father's voice. And so I, I, I'm, I know I'm, my notes are gone, guys, in the back. Sorry, but uh, I had, it, it was life changing. Have you ever had those life changing experiences? And encounters, at 13, my eternity changed. At 21, my life changed. There was more than what happened at 13. I look back at 13, and I know now by looking back and by the Scripture, what happened to me that night was my spirit became born again, alive unto God. And uh, <clears throat> I may not even get off this testimony, but we're going we're to get a few Scriptures in before it's done. In college, I had, I, I was, and the, and I'm, I'm cautious to go back too much, too much things, and, but, the, I was just, I was raised in an environment and a lifestyle of fighting and meanness. Some, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was just a way of life, and, um, um, I was in a fight. I was, it was in a fight with a head of a, a, a gang out of El Paso, and uh, I was beating this young boy so badly, and he was bleeding from both eyes, nose, mouth, and, and, and his face. You know all these movies where the guys just punch each other, especially grown men, punch each other, there's no blood, they fight for 10 minutes, there's no blood? That's not real! That is not real! Uh, so I had him pinned down and, and we're just beating him senseless. And the Lord, something supernatural. This was a life-changing encounter for me. Something supernatural happened while I'm sitting on top of him. I suddenly, I was looking in his eyes, and I saw deep into his soul. It's like the Lord took me into his soul, and I saw fear. And, and that's what you want to see when you're fighting somebody. You know what I'm saying? But I saw fear, and when I saw that fear deep inside of him, a compassion rose up inside of me for him. A true compassion. And I couldn't hit him anymore. I, I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that was. I didn't like it. And I, you know, I threatened him with his life and got away from there and did all that. And I did not know what that was. But I know what it was now. My spirit was alive unto God. That was the compassion of Jesus that rose up inside of me. I was alive unto God. My head was messed up. My head was messed up. But my heart, my spirit, man, was alive unto God. I had life on the inside of me. And I think Jesus intervened and saved my life and took me a different trajectory that night. Jesus was dealing with me. And having Holy Spirit work in our lives is just a life-changing encounter. And I, I just thank the Lord for His miracle working power. It's so real. It's so wonderful. I want you to have some understanding of the Holy Spirit tonight. You know, when we look at pastors, when we think about pastors, <laughs> I, I've pastored... Two churches, I, Kathy and I founded and started a church in West Texas and pastored there a little over eight years. Then we were in Brownwood. We were, like the, we were the lead pastors there and 
pastored there for 15 years and back here for a couple of years. And I found out something about people's expectations of pastors. <laughs> You know, that first church, I had no idea about pastoring and what that meant. I got a lot of free counsel. <laughs> this is what you need to be doing. This is how you need to be acting. <laughs> Man. And I saw people's expectations of pastors. They want them to be the best teachers, the best preachers, do the best weddings and the best funerals. They want them to be counselors, theologians, prayer warriors. They want them to be friendly and personable, of course, you know. Uh, patient, the best administrators. Here's God on your behalf, professional, humble, wise, and knowledgeable, and so many other things. They want you to be that whole package wrapped up in one person. And I dare say that most pastors can't feel half of that. But if they did feel that, wouldn't you follow somebody like that? See, I was thinking, I was looking at it, I thought, okay, uh, yeah, I, I'm learning more and more about Pastor Austin, but I'm thinking, Jacob, 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 Jacob. I, I've been around him a lot of times. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I want to hang out with these guys. I want to draw from them. I want to walk with them. I want them to walk with me. Now think about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now I realize men can't be perfect and they're not, they can't feel all of the things sometimes. They don't have all the answers. We don't. We're people like everybody else. But Jesus was telling his disciples when he was leaving, he was trying to explain to them, I'm about to get out of here. I'm about to leave here. And they're not liking that. They're not liking that at all. He said, no, no, no. It's expedient for you that I go. That means it's to your advantage so that I send the Holy Spirit, another counselor. He said, it's better off for you for me to go than for me to stay here as one man. Wow. Now, they wasn't buying that at first. Right? But he said, it's to your advantage. It's going to, now, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he said, he's going to be your teacher, your guide. When you read the things all about the teacher, he's our comforter, our revealer, our trainer, our provider of wisdom. Life and energy comes through him, revelation. He knows all things, searches even the depths of God. Why wouldn't you want somebody like that in your life? Why wouldn't you want the Holy Spirit to walk with you? Why wouldn't you want him to fill you up to overflowing? You know what I'm saying? When I read that and see that the Holy Spirit is all that, I'm saying I'm all in, man. I'm not going to resist Holy Spirit. I'm not going to push anything back. Holy Spirit, come on. Come on. You do all that you want to do. You do it any way you want to. Why wouldn't I want that? Now, how many of you have heard preachers who have asked you, said, have you read the back of the book? Have you read the back of the book? Yeah, I would say, yeah, we win. <laughs> You know, that kind of, you know, you've heard preachers. We win. It's all, it's a, it's a happy ending, right? It ain't always so much fun getting there. But it's all good in the end, right? And I guarantee the devil's going to pay for his wickedness and evil. I'm grateful for that. But it's all, it's a happy ending. You know, and I think about when Christians, we as Christians having a revelation that it's all going to be all right in, at the end. Even though I don't understand everything that's going now, I think that when we have that idea and that revelation, we have a different outlook on life. We have a different outlook on our walk. And when you think about Holy Spirit, he's, He is the one God that transcends all uh, professions, all endeavors to guide us in every area of our life. He can give us witty ideas for our businesses. He can give us pers uh, personal advice on our battles that we battle with personally our life decisions, and He's not just any old guide. He's not just any old guide, but He can guide us in every area of our life. And when I think about that, I think about Holy Spirit, and at the end of the book, listen, you don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit because anything that He does, there's a happy ending. He's, he's guiding you toward a happy ending, toward a solution, toward success, toward overcoming, toward being a victor. Anything that the Holy Spirit is guiding you for is for the glory of God in your life. But I've seen people who are afraid of Holy Spirit because they don't understand. There's challenges, and we'll talk about some of that. God is so good to us. He guides us in every kind of our calling, and, and from running a business to even having a family. How many of you discovered that when you had that baby, it didn't come with an instruction manual? <laughs> Holy Spirit, I need you now. I don't know how to do this. How to be a better friend. How to be a better friend. How to be in a better place as a person. 
And I think about all these experiences and the testimonies that we hear about what God does. And, you know, these experiences, I believe that they evoke passions on the inside of us. When, you, when someone shares something with me, how God impacted their life or what God did in their life, man, I, man, I, I feel a hunger come up inside of me. I want more. I want to experience that. I want to see that. You know, and I think about what is it that would prompt us? What, what is it that would prompt you to put aside all preconceived ideas of what you think about God and press into Him and pursue Him? Amen? And I, you know, I, I, life... I think about when I have an open heart about that. I, you know, I, I really envy people who have been all over the world in missionary work and things like that and some of the experience. I haven't been to many places. I've been in Mexico, of course, and being living close to Mexico, but I've also been on a trip to Haiti, a couple of mission trips there down in the jungles of Haiti, and I saw something I saw when I went down to Haiti, they don't, they don't think like we do. They don't look like we do. They don't act like we do. They speak French, Creole, and things I couldn't understand. I was almost in a culture shock. But I saw the hardships. You know what I did see? People love their kids. I don't, I don't care where they live. People love their kids. I saw that where lives parallel. You know, maybe they, they don't... The blessings that we have, so grateful for my doorknobs. <laughs> and the things that, that people go through but our lives parallel in so many ways. They had no choice but to believe God, and we saw signs and wonders, great things. And I think about, when I think about all these things that go on, and I see the exciting things that happen to other people, I realize, listen, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what happened in their life can happen in my life. And, and, and I, I just have had such an excitement about being filled with the Holy Ghost that night and what that's been like. And, and I, I think that, and, and I, I can, I'll prove it by Scripture, and I believe this, that it's for everybody. I didn't realize that not everybody wants to hear it. <laughs> I thought, wow, are you kidding me? God's not a myth or a fable. He's real. And He's powerful. He'll change your life. He'll do all these things in your life. And I, you know, I think about these people who truly see in the end that, that the outcomes of this life, it's going to be happy, it's going to be good, have a different outlook. And you say, Lord, okay, I see the end, so Lord, what is my part to play in this? God, you got a plan. you got a plan. So what is my part to play in my world where I exist right now? What is it you want to speak into my life? Listen, I... I didn't start out studying at New Mexico State University in civil engineering with a skill set that prepared me to be a pastor. I don't remember one calculus class that taught me how to love on people. <laughs> they didn't care. You know, and I thought, man, all those years, well, what, what, you know. But you know what? It's worth every bit of it. And you might, it doesn't matter what your past is, where you've been, hadn't been, God will use every bit of that for His glory. Uh, the things that God accomplished in my life through all those years working in secular, working in the oil fields, working in all those things, God used it for His glory. You understand what I'm saying? I asked the Lord once, because when, when I looked at Kathy's life, who, who grew up in church, loved the Lord with a passion, had such a revelation, such a relationship with the Lord that when things would happen... Now, let me tell you this. This is funny. When we first started dating, she said, I'm just going to tell you something, boy. I want you to know this. I love Jesus first and then you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, <laughs> I wanted to be numero uno, but I can take second place as long as she'll take me, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but she would say things would happen. Some of the challenges we face, she said, no, that's not God. How do you know it's not God? Because I know He loves me too much for that. And I thought, Lord, if I had just, if I had just gone to church back then. Listen, folks, be careful about looking back and trying to regret things. Just look forward. You know, I, I said, God, if I had just grown up in church like Kathy, I might have been a better person. I might have... A, been a so much better, not hurt so many people, not done this and not done that and could have achieved this and et cetera, et cetera. And I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, where did you go for eight years? Where did you go? You know, I, I, at 13, that, that little innocent boy to 21, where did you go? And I don't know that it makes sense to you. It, 
And, and I, I, maybe I don't understand it all now, but the Lord spoke to me. He said, listen, I needed you to have a warrior spirit. I needed you to have a warrior spirit. Now, that don't make sense. I said, Lord, you could have just told me that. Maybe I'd have, <laughs> I could have fought with the deacons or something. I don't know. <laughs> but sometimes he created a tenacity in my heart and my life. One time in, well, I'm just spilling my guts. Maybe we'll throw this away and don't take it online, okay? But um, pastoring is not easy. It's, 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 I have a family member that thinks pastors and preachers are the sorriest, laziest people in the world. I got news for them. It's the hardest job I've ever had. I've worked the oil field. I've worked lots of different jobs. It, it's tough. And I asked the Lord, standing right there on that front row in Brownwood, Texas, Church is growing, and, but it wasn't no fun what I was experiencing this one day. And I said, Lord, why in the world did you do this to me? <laughs> why did you bring me down here? He said, because you won't let go. I said, okay. And I'm not going to let go. Sometimes you need to have the tenacity to just stick with it and stay with it until clarity comes. And, and, and try to look at the good things that you have learned and what God has accomplished in your life past, okay? And, and say, so God, it, it's all, I'm just putting it up into your hands. It's all part of your plan. I don't know where it goes, but I've seen things that, that God has done in my past. Now looking back, but I didn't see it at the time. I said, God, I'm thanking you that you're, you, you've got purpose for my life. You've got direction for my life. And Holy Spirit, I need to know what I need to do with my life right now. Praise God. Okay, I'm going to skip over about 10 pages of my notes here. <laughs> uh, let's go to Acts the ninth chapter. Let me share a couple of things. Got a few more minutes here. I'll pull this on you again for the new folks. How many of you new folks give me just five more minutes? Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. We're going to be here. I can, I can get through these notes. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, Acts the ninth chapter. This was, there, there's something good about this, and, and I'm going to just share a few more scriptures before I close, and we can pick it up next week for the three of you that come back. Acts the ninth chapter. <laughs> you remember Paul's conversion, where he had the encounter with Jesus and he was blinded. They had to lead him off to a home and left him there for a few days. And don't you know the things that were going on in his mind? Absolutely amazing, thinking about that. And so God, you know, the Lord Jesus talks to Ananias, and Ananias wants you to go over and pray for him. I want his sight restored, and I want him filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, but Lord, don't you know who that is? <laughs> that, that's Paul. He's the guy that's throwing people in prison. He's the guy that was there when Stephen was killed and probably started it, and, and it's all his fault. But the Lord said, i got great things to show him. Things that he's even going to have to suffer, my sake. God's got a plan for him. So let's look at Acts 9, chapter verse 17. And Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him to Paul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So two things happened to him here. He had a miraculous healing and that he was filled with the Holy Spirit for service to God. You know, in Romans uh, 15th chapter, <laughs> now this is amazing. In Romans 15, I'm going to insert this, and we'll pick it back up in Acts the 9th chapter in a moment. Yet I dare not boast about anything. This is Paul saying anything except what Christ has done through me. Bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. Now look at the next verse. Verse 19. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. Miraculous signs and wonders. The Gentiles were convinced that God was real. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Illyricum. He said... In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ. He's our deliverer. He's our healer. By His stripes, I was healed. He bore my sickness, disease, my pains, and my sorrow. 
God put all those things on him so that I wouldn't have to live in that. See, Paul was following, and he could not have done that without Holy Spirit. Now look, we go back to 9. So in 9th chapter, when he came, Ananias prayed for him. He had a miraculous healing. His scales fell from his eyes. But what about life after the miracle? You know, that miracle healing in my knee was fabulous. The Lord could have just left me alone right there. But said, no, you, you need the Holy Ghost if you're going to be successful in your next step. Life after the miracle. Miracles, signs, and wonders are, are alive today. I mean, wisdom and knowledge and, and, and anointing didn't pass away with the apostles. And I'll, I can prove a lot of that and spend time doing it if I can ever get past the testimonies. But <laughs> I'm so excited about the Lord and tell somebody about what's happened. But there's life after the miracle. So the Lord knew that Paul would need the Holy Spirit to be a good servant to him. So let's look back at verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And look at verse 20. This is what is really cool to me. Now he had three days of blindness, three or four days. Was it three, four? Huh? Three. Three days. Don't you know the pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together for him? And it says in verse 20, and straightway, he got full of the Holy Ghost, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I mean, now, <laughs> I would say to you, if you just got born again today, you need to grow in some knowledge before you get out in the weeds, okay? <laughs> I mean, getting out there uh, with the devil. Uh, but here, Saul was raised on the Scripture but something inspired him, something enabled him to prove and preach that Christ was the Messiah. Amen. Oh, my word. And he increased the more in strength. See, and, and Paul, he immediately started witnessing. Peter did the same thing on the day of Pentecost. Jesus told those disciples, he said, now don't you leave Jerusalem. Don't you do it. You stay right there until the promise comes. And on the day of Pentecost, those 120 in that upper room, praying and interceding. What were they praying about? Probably their, their aches and their pains and anybody else who wanted prayer. I don't know. But God, prepare our hearts for this. And when the Holy Spirit came that day, it filled them with the Holy Spirit. Peter, immediately the pieces came together. And he preached on the streets. He began to pull scripture from Joel the prophet. And said, this is what the Joel spoke of. I mean, he put it... And see, the thing about it is, what I saw from that, Holy Spirit has a way of just putting it all together for us. Amen. Putting it all together. That's what he did with Paul. That's what he did with Peter. <laughs> because I remember Jesus said in John, he said, John 16, he said, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. You just can't get it now. It ain't going to come together. When the Spirit of truth comes, though, He will guide you into all truth. He'll put the pieces together. He'll not speak on His own, but will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you all about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. Amen. The Holy Spirit, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to preach the gospel with power, signs and wonders. Amen. Oh, my word. <laughs> uh oh First, now, y'all gave me about 40 more minutes. What I, uh, no, let me say this, though. I know that day, it doesn't say that day that Paul spoke with other tongues, unknown tongues, but in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, when he's giving instruction to the church, here's how you're going to act in church. I love, I, I could teach another three hours just on 1 Corinthians 14. But there toward the end of 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, he said, I thank my God, I, I'm reading for Amplified, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than any of you, or all of you put together. Holy Spirit, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. And we could go on and on, and I, I'd love to take you to chapter 8 of Acts and chapter 10 and chapter 11. And <clears throat> We need to approach and experience this with understanding. And we'll go back over some of these chapters out of Acts. 
and, and see how God moved. Let me show you that there's more. Now let me get to the, I'll just, ha, I'll just have to go over here and I'll close with this. Mm, man, there's so much. I got 14 pages of notes. I'm just saying. <laughs> Listen, here we are, you and I right here. We've got to make decisions. It's like the blind man that was healed and they brought him before the religious leaders and he said, Listen, I don't know where this guy came from. I don't know where he's going. I know if he wasn't a God, he couldn't do this. But he said, I know this one thing. I was blind, but now I see. Now, when I met Kathy, the moment she walked in the room, now she, it was a blind date. Never met her before. Blind date. And we just did it to get our friends off our back. <laughs> okay, we'll do it this one time and that's it. Don't ever ask me again. <laughs> She walked in, and I fell in love with her the moment I saw her. Amen. Now, there'll be others come up here and tell you that that's, that's not real. That doesn't exist. People say that. It doesn't exist. But it's worked for 47 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, now, <laughs> here's, here's what I'm getting at. Even though they say that that doesn't happen, I might have believed it had they got to me the day before I met Kathy. But I knew what love at first sight was. I knew what God had done to my heart. And God spoke it to my heart afterwards. This experience that I had with Holy Spirit of praying in tongues, and, and I'll show you what that's all about too, because that's a good question. What in the world is that for? If people had got to me March 22nd, 1976, and said that this is not real, I might have believed them. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But when I experienced it, I said, this is of God. This is of God. It has radically changed my life, the encounter of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And these are some good questions that we're going to answer as we go through this next couple of weeks. What purpose does it serve? That's a good question, right? Because uh, I, I was really conservative, and I visited a Pentecostal church once or twice as a kid, and I thought, Lord, I don't want to be like, that person that's running around the room. I, you know, I know condemnation and guilt, but I didn't want to be like that. You know, if that's what it's all about, I don't think I want that. What's it for? Is it something that's additional to my salvation? Didn't I get it all at salvation? Who's doing the baptism? Who's doing the baptizing? Do I, do I go to certain ones that are anointed to do this? Is there a prerequisite for receiving it? And why, did, why don't I speak in tongues? Right? Why, why, these are all very, very good questions to ask that I'm going to answer as we get together next week. But I will, I'm going to close with just a, 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 something about Jesus. I'm, I'm going to share with you. I'm, I'm going to share with you about the doctrine of baptisms and explain that because we don't hear that enough. We don't hear it taught enough, or I haven't heard it over the years. How many of you heard the, know about the doctrine of baptisms? Plural. Good. And some of you, don't be ashamed or, or, or shy, but how many of you don't know what that means? Don't, haven't heard that? Good. I appreciate your sincerity and honesty about that because we need to understand that. Over in Ephesians, over in Ephesians, it talks about there's one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and people have built doctrines to say there's only one baptism. Then over Hebrews, the sixth chapter, it said we need to go on from these doctrines, the doctrine of baptisms, plural. So, okay, Lord, what's that all about? And when we get up here and we do baptism, I want you to understand, and I try to share this with people, and I've heard people say, well, why, why, why do we need to be baptized? Because Jesus did. He was showing us how, to, how it's to be done. We're, it's nothing, what we're being baptized is nothing like what Jesus did. Not in the least. He had nothing to be forgiven of. He had nothing to be washed from. He stepped into a priesthood, and part of the requirements of the priesthood back then was ceremonial washing and anointing to step in at the very age he was, step into the priesthood. And he, it was a ceremonial type washing of water, but God anointed him with the Holy Ghost. And you notice after that happened, he stepped into a, an anointed priesthood with signs and wonders and supernatural things. Now, the baptism of, it served another purpose of Jesus being baptized. Let me show you this in John, the first chapter. Do you know that John, 
wasn't fully convinced at first that Jesus was the Messiah? How many of you knew that? Okay. The rest of you means y'all didn't know that, did you? Hey, I feel like I'm giving you something tonight, okay? <laughs> but listen, when after he baptized Jesus, there was another time when he was baptizing over in John, the first chapter, verse uh, 28. There's an encounter, encounter that took place at Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man's coming after me is far greater than I, for he existed long before me. Now listen to this. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. Now look at verse 33. I didn't know that he was the one. But when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I saw this happen to Jesus, and I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Amen. Amen. So Jesus being baptized was also fulfilling prophecy. It was prophesied. And John saw that and it fulfilled prophecy and he knew he was the one. And John's testimony said, there's a man coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Mark, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke 3 says he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I'm going to give you something to chew on and then I'll... Turn it over to Pastor Terry. Baptism. I'm just, I'm giving it to you. I'm, we could, I could take you through so many scriptures. We ain't got time. Because y'all didn't really mean it when you gave me five more minutes, okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about baptism, there are three elements concerning baptism. Let's look at water baptism. It'll help your understanding, okay? There are three elements. There's the candidate being baptized. There's the one doing the baptizing, and there's the element that they're being baptized into, right? So when we're water baptizing, who's the candidate? You and I, who have accepted Jesus. What's the element they're being baptized in? Water. Who's doing the baptizing? The minister. Something like they're doing the baptizing. So you got those three elements. And then when 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it starts talking about the body of Christ. We are all one. We're all part of the body of Christ and 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Now, who's the candidate? We all. We all. Who's doing the baptizing in that Scripture? By one Spirit. We all are baptized into one body. You know, and then when I read that, it started piecing together. So those are the three elements it's like when you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes you and immerses you into Christ. You've heard, I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been baptized by the blood of the Lamb. Well, that's supernatural. It's a spiritual baptism. The Holy Spirit took you and immersed you into Christ. The Scripture started coming together. You go look them up tonight. See, all those that have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death. Baptized into Christ, into Christ, into Christ. Scripture after Scripture. When you became born again, baptized into Christ. And then John is talking about Jesus. He said, there's a man coming after me. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Who's the candidate? You, the believer. He, who's doing the baptizing? Jesus. What's he baptizing you in? The Holy Ghost. So there's another baptism that we haven't even looked at. Are y'all... Now here's the thing in Ephesians, and I, I, I promise this is my second, third closing. Here... <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians said there's one baptism, one Lord, there's one God, one faith. If there's one baptism, if there's one baptism that I've got to have not to split hell wide open, Lord, what would it be? I've had people tell me, and I'm going to prove it next week. And I had a friend who told me, plumb after I was saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and laying hands on people, people getting saved, and I never even heard about water baptism. He said, if you ain't been water baptized, you'll split hell wide open. So, whoa, Lord, if that's true, everything I've experienced at this point is a lie. I didn't even know you're supposed to be water baptized. 
I, this is a lie. No, if there's one it's, that it's God. And I've had other people, Pentecost, say, if you ain't bad baptized the Holy Ghost speaking other tongues, you ain't making it to heaven. No. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Amen.